Happy Friday evening, Anons. I am joined now by Cryptos. Cryptos, how are you doing? I'm really good, thank you. Um, thank you for having me on. And um, I looked at your your list of past guests, and many are mutuals and so forth. So sometimes when you get somebody that you're not necessarily familiar with, says, "Hey, would you like to come on my podcast?" I'll often run it by a group chat or two and say, "Hey, you know, should I go on this guy's show? Is this going to be safe? Um, you know, I'm not going <laughs> sure. to get like ambushed or something, you know?" And they're like, "Yeah, no, no." And then they're like. And then, so I've gotten a, I've gotten in the habit of doing a little bit of, of research. I just, so I looked at the past guest look, and I'm like, oh wow, you've had all my friends on, so um, this should be fun. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, yeah. No, and, and I knew it was it was only a matter of time, Kryptos, because um, I've been I've been following your writings as well as your appearances for for quite a while. And uh, it sounds like you've been you you kept busy this week. What am I like your your fifth uh, uh, live stream or something like that? Yeah, the fifth, fifth, yeah, fifth street. So two of them I did on my own for for the Christian ghetto. So I I was hosting and recording, and then I I um I recorded with another three, yeah, another three, and then I think one that we recorded a while ago got posted as well. So altogether, it'd be like six podcasts out there floating in the ether, um, for basically a seven day time span. So it's um been interesting. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, well, Kryptos, I mean, on the on, on the off chance that um, some of our listeners are maybe not familiar with um, with you or your work, would you mind just kind of providing a brief uh, introduction about uh, you know who you are and what you're about? Yeah, I I am. Um, well, I, I I do an anonymous poster, like keep my face behind the 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 avatar. Um, largely because I have a, a business that I maintain and I my client base is fairly, uh, uh, even though like, I'd say probably 75% of my clients are from the Christian community, I still have a fairly broad client base of people from various political persuasions and so forth. So for my wife's sake, more than for mine, she worries that you know I'm going to end up saying something dumb and it'll get my business cratered on me or, or yeah, worse, they, get me arrested because I, I'm in the frozen <laughs> north. So <laughs> the wives, um, so I'm, 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 yeah. but I got, st I got started doing this. It's, it's kind of a, it's a fun little story. So um, during the middle of COVID, I, I had been gradually moving my politics away from your typical, um, what we would call like the chamber of commerce conservatism, um, you know, the AEI Institute, you know, free mar free global markets, um, you know, small government, low taxes, all the, the usual strong military, all the, the usual grab bag of stuff. And beginning around 2008 with the with the mortgage crisis began asking questions and walking away from ideas like maybe NAFTA wasn't such a great thing, these types of things, mm -hmm. right? And um, then slowly just moving away from and then challenging ideas within myself. And then COVID hit. Um, and I had already sort of moved a fair bit. I'd been, you know, moving from, you know, National Review to, um, you know, the, the guys at, at Claremont with um, American mm -hmm. Mind and um, the the one that Dreher used to, to, used to write for, um, uh, the American Conservative, uh, publications like that, right, that, um, that were a little bit farther right than, say, um, Chronicles magazine, that type of thing. And then during COVID, I, um, uh, listening on the American Mind, uh, Michael Anton did a few podcasts and he hosted a gentleman by the name of Charles Haywood. And he says, well, I do these book reviews and I host them on my own website. And I discovered that, that Charles Haywood had recorded um, the vast majority of his book reviews into podcast format. So it was COVID and I was in the middle of doing a, a full house renovation from top to bottom. So while I worked away on my house, I would put Charles on and I would just listen. I think I listened to like 230 episodes back to back to back, wow. just sort of one after the other. And they're good. And then so, you know, um, I'm, I'm generally not afraid to sort of make the ask or reach out. So he would leave an email in his in his book reviews. And so I emailed him and he's very approachable. And um, now because he's a busy man, he didn't always get back quickly, but he surprisingly replied to quite a number of my emails. We had some back and forth. And um, he said, you know, your stuff is really good. You should write. And so that's kind of what I did. I started a 
um, a substack called Seeking the Hidden Thing. And then I think, well, how do I promote my substack? Well, Twitter, that seems like the place that people do that sort of thing, right? And so, you know, being in my mid 50s, I took up the young man's game of Twitter and figured out that I was hmm. not so bad. So I, I have, you know, read a lot of stuff over the years and I would be listening to people and, um, and, and seeing threads and tweets and stuff on there and thinking, well, these people really don't understand anything because they don't, they haven't, it looks like they haven't read Jack Alul. So I started doing these, these monster threads, explaining to people kind of using Alul's analysis of the technological society and how this opens up a better understanding of how your government works um, and how biz business works and all these sorts of things. And my account just kind of took off and sort of one thing led to another. And now, yeah, I have um, a fairly sizable readership on my Substack, and, you know, a, a, um, a fairly good network of, of mutuals and an account with over 10,000 followers, which is crazy. So it's always fun to say to my kids that, you know, like, your, your dad's a, a Twitter influencer, <laughs> like <laughs> yeah. a social media influencer, which is just hysterical <laughs> to your teens, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's a, yeah, that's what my hobby. I'm a social, inf social media. Influencer. I know it must, it must put them to shame. Um, oh, it's I, you know, I, I have a funny anecdote about, about Jacques Ellul, uh, very briefly. I just, I, years ago, back when I, I still, you know, worked at, in an office, uh, uh, another buddy of mine in that, uh, that business was, he somehow got his way into to Jacques Alul and he kept, he care, was carrying around um, his, his books all over the place and always trying to talk, talk to people about him, talk, talk to me about him. And I finally just had to be like, Hey, listen, man, you got to stop talking about Jacques Alul to everybody. And he was like, why? What's, what's the matter? I was like, that's the Unabomber's favorite writer. And he was like, Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> just, <laughs> I think he like went and, and and apologized to HR because he just had been talking everybody's oh ear off about the about Alul, and, and 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 that's that's kind of the thing that you know one of the reason one of the reasons why Ted Kaczynski was right about everything is because he read Jack Alul, mm. and people said, "Have you read Ted Kaczynski?" I said, "Yes, I've read the Manifesto, I've read the," but I said. A lot of what you read there, you will find in much greater detail with that. And, you know, there was a reason why Ted Kaczynski was right about everything. He did his homework um, and um, his stuff makes a lot of sense. It's just you sort know, of like a, a couple of things more, that really the FBI doesn't approve of, you know, so like a, like a much more violent uh, Mensch's mold bug. You know, he read the classics and and represented them to people. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. Right. Um, and uh you know, it, it's so funny when you do like a Lulian analysis of stuff and then people come back, have you ever read, have you ever read Ted Kaczynski? I'm like, yes, I've, I've, I've read Ted, but it's, um, you know, cause people, cause the, 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 the manifesto is, is relatively short, all things considered mm -hmm. and fairly straightforward. And Alul's works are fairly, um, voluminous and expansive. And sometimes Alul can go on longer than he should on certain topics. So mm -hmm. it's, um, but at, at the same time, once you, you know, you, you get dive into a Lule, you really do have a, a grasp, um, of what I would call the source code for a lot of modern society that the, the primary ideology ideology of us is not like liberalism or conservatism really, but really, um, technique. And, um, it is the, it is technique in many ways, mm -hmm the mindset of technique that actually drives the political ideology of liberalism. I actually, so. in fact, in fact, I, I, I meant to give this, uh, this, this PSA because I, owe I, I owe you, uh, Kruptos as well as Jacques Alul, a, a public apology. Um, you probably didn't, didn't catch this, but, um, a couple streams ago, I was, I was hosting a stream with Oren McIntyre, who, who I'm guessing is, is a mutual of ours. Uh, yeah. and the, the stream itself was, um, was, <laughs> Uh, the subject matter was Protestantism, and I was making the the, the observation that even with a lot of the kind of Protestant um, influencers, Protestant kind of thought leaders that I see today, uh, such as himself and, and such as you, I noticed we're pulling on a lot of Catholic writers. And I, I mentioned, you know, he McIntyre is always talking about, um, uh, you know, the Italian elite school or... Um, kind yes. of older yeah. Catholic thinkers. And I, I mentioned you and Alul, I've hence realized someone politely corrected me that Alul was not in fact a Catholic. And I've been trying to figure out why I had that impression. I'm, it may have just been my presumption because he's French, 
because um, he's French. But he was actually a huge, he was actually a, 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 a Lul was broadly speaking a a Calvinist, a, like a continental Calvinist, and his sort of you know no nonsense, um, unflinching view of reality is very Calvinist in nature, although. Um, one would not call him an orthodox Calvinist in that sense. He, he's not doctrinaire. Um, he had a lot of um, theological opinions that sort of colored outside of the line. So, and then, but that's that's neither here nor there for the most part. But yeah, well, actually, that's so a great he was. That, sorry, that's a great. That's that's a great segue because I, I was going to yeah. to ask you about. I guess that kind of dovetails in into Calvinism, and one of the the topics I, I wanted to explore with you is. Um, to the best of my knowledge, I apologize. Uh, apologies if I'm wrong. I believe I believe you're my first Calvinist guest. I've been kind of doing this, uh, not not intentionally, but I, I appear to be doing this um, tour of of many different kind of Christian denominations lately. Um, and so, as my first Calvinist guest, to, to the best of my knowledge, I was wondering if you'd be willing to, in broad strokes. And I, I confess up front that I realize how unfair this question is because it's it's so broad, but maybe we can we can make an attempt at it of of kind of describing what you feel distinguishes Calvinists both 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 theologically as well as temperamentally um, from other Protestant denominations. Like what what, for example, might how how, how might one consider a Calvinist um you know, as opposed to ju juxtaposed to to a Baptist or or a Methodist or or other sort of yeah, it, it's probably easier to do it somewhat in isolation. Um, probably okay. the 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 bigger the bigger the 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 biggest um, well distinguishing is is Calvinism is a lot closer to um, the Catholic tradition than many other Protestants, largely because. Um, Calvinism did not uh, disavow, so to speak, the the um, the scholastic tradition. So there is hmm. a reform scholastic tradition, and and that might be maybe the thing that defines Calvinism is its rationalism in many ways. Um, and so the Calvinists really work to, to think through issues theologically. Now they don't necessarily, and I say this as a Calvinist and you have to be careful too, because when you get up to preach, you, you generally sort of stay within the lines and you give it sort of the party line because your role as a preacher is not really to, uh, in my mind anyways, is not to undermine people's faith convictions. Right. But that doesn't mean that privately you don't sort of go like, yeah, if I were writing, this is not how I would do it. Right. But at the same time, even as I have, you know, explored and embraced some of the wisdom in other traditions, I just find myself that basically at heart, in terms of disposition and so forth, that I'm a Cal that I'm a Calvinist. Now, a lot of people don't talk about their Calvinism just because I think, you know, they come with kind of a bad bad reputation um, as being. Um, you know, hard nosed, closed minded. They're, you know, they're the kind of got people that will burn you at the stake. If if is you... the, I'm trying to remember is that that this um <laughs> yeah a, Calvin did or... burn someone at the stake in Geneva so it, it's, well um... I, I, I wasn't even thinking of that I was thinking I'm trying to remember if this this is a you know slur uh, that maybe gets applied to Calvinists the the frozen chosen is that. Does that ring a bell? Is that yeah? So yeah. Calvinism tends to bias the mind over the heart or emotions. Hmm. You know, people always talk. You know, it's all head knowledge, not heart knowledge, which is itself a stupid split. Um, but that's that's another hmm. kind of thing. So, so you you will find generally that those who, are, especially people groups that are dispositionally, uh, you know, from an ethnic perspective, to be more blunt, hard nosed, and to just kind of tell it as it is, um, will. You know the French. There's you know there's a significant French Calvinism. You know the um, Hungarians are have a significant. I think Victor Orban grew up. I, I might be mistaken, but I believe he grew up in a Calvinist church. Um, hmm. And then um, 
you know, the Dutch, of course, Scottish Calvinism, Presbyterianism, you know, there's that picture of, um, you know, you're not, as as a, a mutual black horse will say, you, you're not truly Calvinist until you can feel Jonathan Edwards' displeasure, um, you know, looking down <laughs> upon you, right? So there, so that there's that Scottish, Scottish English Presbyterianism that that's, that's prevalent. And what you find too is, and see, when you're in the Protestant world, there's a, a temptation to sort of lump everybody into this broad category of evangelical, but um, we're a historical confessional church. So we would um, profess, you know, the Apostles' Creed, Nicene Creed, and we have in the Dutch tradition, Dutch Reformed tradition, what's called the three forms of unity based on the Belgic Confession, the Heidelberg Catechism, and the Canons of Dort. Um, and so those are what in the reform world are called, at least the Dutch reform world, the three forms of unity. And so they are really the theological expression and touchstones, touchstones of, of, of our tradition. And so the real markers um, are the view of the sacraments um, and um, then predestination is one, the other big marker, but I think the the other one that the people don't often consider is the 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 sovereignty of God, and so God as as King it really plays a, a large role in in Calvinist thinking, especially as you get into the late eighteen hundreds and early twentieth century in in the neo Calvinist movement as it arose in um, in the Netherlands. Um, the most prominent figure being um, Abraham Kuyper, who ended up becoming um, the Prime Minister of Holland. So you know, it's 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 very fascinating um, when Rod Dreher began doing his um, Benedict option, and mm -hmm. then you know, um, and as Christian nationalism, th this whole movement has come to the foreground. And, and I'm not crazy about the title, but I, I get sort of broadly speaking where the movement is coming from. We look back into our own tradition and realize that. In in the reform Dutch reform tradition, this is something that we did. Um, what is going through American Protestantism now is a movement that that swept through Dutch Protestantism in the the late 1800s and early 20th century, and ultimately led to, like when you see the the Christian Democrat parties, a lot of those are rooted in in this particular era, this particular movement, this idea of an active and robust. Christian presence in the political community to counter the 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 atheism of um, of enlightenment of, of enlightenment liberalism, and so mm. they they felt that they needed to be in the public sphere a a vocal presence to counter the liberalism of of the enlightenment um, in society. And so that's kind of broadly. Those are sort of your your big your big piece, and we can dive into more deeply. Um, yeah, you know some yeah. of I the mean, particulars I, of those things. I am uh, I am sort of I guess instinctually I I already did sort of if if I'm looking at a I guess a uh, a wheel of of Protestantism I would I would have put Calvinists sort of um, on the opposite side of that from something like e evangelicals. Um, who are yeah, or Anabaptists history. specifically, right? Mm -hmm. So, infinite adult baptism is a uh, is is that big dividing line, and and the the need to be rebaptized to to enter into um, a church, an Anabaptist church is is a sore point for many in our tradition. So that's that's mm -hmm. one of those, yeah. So that's one of those things. Um, you know, it goes, it's a creedal thing. I believe in one baptism for the remission of sins, right? So mm -hmm. that, you know, um, you, you at, anyways, it, even just the demand that you should be rebaptized as an adult is considered an insult if if you're to move to a church that's Anabaptist. For for many who are more, now there's many who are not, not terribly theological on their own, who it doesn't bother them that much. But for those of us that are, um, it it's just one of those things that just seems... You know, when you get into sort of divisions within Protestantism, it's one of those things that's, you know, a bit of an affront that you don't take credibly the fact that I was baptized as an infant and you're demanding that I be rebaptized or I can't become a full member of your community. Um, well, let's say I move out to an area where there are no Reformed churches and the only the only game in town is is a broader evangelical church that does adult baptism. And I'm like, OK, I can't serve on council because I won't be rebaptized. You know, right. these types of things I, you know, that and and so. 
yeah, that those are some of those issues that do divide. You also just mentioned cryptos, um, the probably what is, I guess, the most widely disseminated or, or widely known concept probably with within pop culture associated with Calvinism, which is just that the concept of of predestination. Um, yeah. And maybe this is what gives you guys your 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 grim and austere uh, <laughs> reputation amongst yeah. other Protestants. But I mean, I mean. There, there I, there I would probably, ways. I would not do it justice, but I mean, the, the popular understanding of it is sort of, you know, there's, there's a, there's an, an elect few people that God has predetermined to save. And there's really not much of anything anybody can do about it because God is infallible. But I'm sure I'm, I'm guessing that that has been very, you know, bodlerized and, um, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's a difficult teaching to it's it's one of those things and you grew up in the reformed church it's it's you know the kind of thing that you agonize over as a teen right um it it's in in part because we misunderstand and and really don't take seriously the way that we used to um the holiness of god and human sinfulness um so it's it's one of these great mysteries that um can trouble people, keep them awake at night. Um, and, and people have, you know, sort of shipwrecked their getting lost in, in trying to understand it. Um, it's in, in terms of the way that I try to explain it to people um, without necessarily getting bogged down into sort of let's, let's examine every one of the texts and so forth. So um you have to sort of frame it within the context, first of all, of, of human sinfulness, right? So mankind was put in the garden and we were given a set of commands by God and we were given the, the ability to either accept the commands of God or to reject them. So do not eat of the fruit um, of the knowledge of good and evil for the day you do so you shall surely die. And we know the biblical account is that humanity grabbed the fruit, ate, and um, from then on forth um, have carried sin and evil with them. So one of the Calvinist and, and we believe, you know, scripturally, biblically rooted ideas is that we are all born into sin by Adam's sin. So this is, you know, Romans as a, as a key Calvinist, um, you know, when you look through Calvin, um, there are more um, quotes from the Pauline corpus or references from the Pauline corpus in the, in the institutes than there are the whole ref, rest of the scriptures. So there's a lot of weight that's placed on the argumentation of Paul, especially in Romans in this regard. But so human beings are born sinful and there's nothing you can do to change that state. So, there's nothing that you do that is good. So it, it, it comes down to the way you define. So what is it? What is a good act? So a good act is one that conforms to, um, to God's will, is done completely um, at sort of the, the, the request, the, the, the initiative of God, and is done for God's glory. Right? And so every act, no matter what you do, is in some ways tainted by your own um, selfish desires, your own need for glory, um, your own, even when you strive to do good, you fall short of the mark that God sets. So even when somebody looks like they're doing good, their actions don't qualify as good. So there's nothing that you do is good. And this is why people sort of dump on Calvinists, you know, a sense of like, <laughs> you know, um, but you know, there's that whole thing of total depravity. Well, that does not mean that we're, that, that there is nothing, that no good in us, but it just means that there's no action that we can cling to as being good or, or redeeming us. So you can't say, well, the good outweighs the bad in your life. And then the Calvinist says, well, no, because every one of your actions is somehow tainted in some way. So it doesn't matter 
how much you you elevate what you're doing, it always falls short. Right? And so, so there, you're in this condition where you you are separated from God. You cannot come into the presence of God because the holiness of God will consume you because you are tainted and sinful. And you cannot make yourself good. So you've got a fundamental problem here. So the, the, the realization of this problem is that the initiative for changing that condition cannot come from ourselves. So it's got to come from God. So God initiates the saving act. He sends his son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus dies, pays the price for our sin. Um, but then there's this whole process of connecting us to that saving action with Christ. So there, you know, we, we talk about sort of the mystery of, of, you know, why one person is saved and not another person saved. Now, that being said, there, there is a, a cogent biblical case that can be made for universalism, that God chooses everyone, right? Hmm. I don't think that that's ultimately right. Um, but it's not completely crazy. So let's put it that way, right? So there's a lot about this. And this is like I said, we get into the deepest, deepest mysteries. You know, there's that, there's that, um, the old saying with the Marines, um, you know, many are called, but few are chosen, right? So salvation works a lot like that. So, and we don't really know. So this is where we get into the whole process of like, like why are some going off to, you know, to perdition, to hell, and why are some being saved? And ultimately, we don't know, right? So there's a whole aspect of salvation that is shielded from us, that it resides within God himself. And, and we're not partial to that. But there is, we are given enough, the, the curtains are pulled back just enough so that you know that if you have a bad day, right, where... Um, you know, things really go off the rails. Let's say you curse God or you do some really horrible stuff that your salvation is not dependent upon anything you do or don't do. Even your ability to choose or not choose, your salvation is not dependent upon that. It's dependent entirely upon God. Hmm. So if you look back on your own life, right, because you know that you can't reach God on your own, um, that if you're honest with yourself, the point you reach to say um, where you make a choice to say, I commit my life to Christ, there began a work, either, you know, the spirit working through friends, through people, but nobody just wakes up with no other influences, never having heard of the gospel and just says, I'm going to believe in Jesus today. It just doesn't happen that way. <laughs> right. So you have all of these influences that are being pushed, being nudged. So you have this whole thing of God's work. He's working in your life. Now, our experience of salvation is very historical. It's bound up in the, the, this moment of choice, like whom will you serve? So we encounter salvation from this point of view of, I have human actions that I'm held responsible for. That's kind of the way it works. So I'm not a puppet. I still retain the, the, the humanity that God created me so I can make choices and God holds me accountable for those choices. It's just that even when I aspire to do good choices, all of those choices fall short, right? So I'm, but yet because they're very real choices, I'm still held accountable for them. So in that decisive moment, I'm expected to say, I believe I chose, even if when I look back, I realize that everything drove me to that moment of choosing was God's doing, right? And then I acknowledge that. And then so now I have the peace and comfort of knowing that if I have a bad day, if I stumble and fall, that um, my salvation is not necessarily in jeopardy because it doesn't belong to me. It belongs to God. And I can rest so I can pick myself up again and I can recommit myself. I go through all the, the just, you know, what we call the rituals, the, the, the graces that God gives us so that we, we can, we can feel again, the, the, the renewal of his salvation and, and, and the fact that we're forgiven. So, you know, we're given these rituals of, of, of repentance, of seeking absolution, of making amends, of, of apologizing, um, all of these, even like paying the penalty for what we've done. But we know that even all of these things have to be worked through, 
that our salvation isn't dependent upon any of those things. I think those are mostly God's gift to us so that we can feel once again, the comfort of knowing that salvation doesn't belong to us. And so really the kind of sense of, of the, you know, the, the Calvinist idea that salvation belongs to God is often something that you come to realize if you're honest with yourself after you're already sort of in the fold and you realize that I only got here because God brought me here. And mm. even the choice that I made was God leading me up to that moment and then giving me the strength to do it, giving me all the, and so for my experience, yeah, I made a choice, but if I'm honest with it, God brought me up and, and it was really, I can just let go and say it was his doing. So yeah, I mouthed the words, I made the commitment, but that commitment was really his doing in my life. And I can just kind of, I can rest in that knowledge that it doesn't depend upon me. And so that's kind of, as far as I can say, you know, now somebody's going to have a lot of questions. Well, why wasn't somebody else say what? Are they? Well, um, you know, it's, it's, I don't have answers for that. And thankfully it doesn't fall on my shoulders to decide who does or doesn't. That's that, that whole area that's clouded in behind sort of the, the knowledge of God or whatever. And then, you know, somebody said, well, how can you trust that God is a loving God in this regard? Well, humanity as a whole deserves, all of us deserve to be um, swept away like humanity was in the flood, right? So that's what we deserve. Um, we no, None of us deserve salvation. So those that are given a gift of salvation are given something that we didn't deserve. Now, not to say, well, why didn't the other people to, you know, be in a position where they didn't deserve to get saved? And then you can sort of run yourself into all kinds of tongue twine twists. And eventually at a certain point, you just simply, I don't understand it all. It's a great mystery. I'm here in the fold. I know that I have been given a task to proclaim the gospel to everybody, and I just leave the rest with God. And mm -hmm. God will save whom he will save. And I content myself, you know, who knows? It, it may end up being on the last day, you know, Christ died. for it, it could very well be everyone. I don't know. And that's not up to me to decide. And it could be just a remnant or a few. Um, and and in the end, salvation belongs to the Lord, and I've got to trust. And it's like the... Um, that, that parable of the, the farmer who employs the, the laborers, right? And so, um, you know, there are those of us who've worked in, in the field all day, and the hard thing would be to come at the end of the day and realize that right at the last moment, everybody got saved. Would you be resenting that? Well, and that's what the parable says. You know, it's the Jesus, Jesus himself said, you know, that I'm the master of the field. If I want to pay somebody for a half second's worth of work and, and give them a full payment of a day's wages, that's really up to me. It's not your business, you know? Mm. Um, and that's a lot of, and, and this is, I think, is a lot of the problem that we have is that we, we, we struggle with this because we generally look at salvation as if it's all about us, when it really isn't. Salvation is actually about God and his glory, his majesty, um, and it, it's, and, and this is a hard thing for people to struggle with. So it's, it's one of these things that, that, um, you know, it, you know, as they say, can the potter say to the, the, or can the clay say to the potter, why didn't you make me a bowl or why didn't you make me a cut? So there is a whole sense of the glory and majesty of God that we, we struggle with. We don't, necessarily tremble before the burning bush like Moses did. We don't take our shoes off because we stand on holy ground. And in part of this is, um, this is part of the cultural decay of our society because people don't fear the Lord anymore. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's it's one of these things, I think, where the doctrine of predestination is um, like a fish out of water culturally. It's an idea that belong, that makes sense in a different cultural setting. And then once you're inside that cultural setting, it gives you a lot more peace because you're you're inside the community. But when you stand outside the community, um, it just seems bizarre and God seems, you know, capricious and punitive. And I have to say to you that, okay, that's maybe the way it seems, but that's not the reality of it. God is a loving God. And, um, you know, it's that sense of, um, I believe so that I understand. And even, even saying that, I don't really understand. I can kind of 
grasp it, but even trying to explain it, I know that that words kind of fall short that way. So that's that is sort of my best rendition of sort of a pastoral version of of predestination that way. Um, mm -hmm. And I would be loath anyone that wants to get into sort of the angels dancing on a head of a pin of of you know the prelapsarian, superlapsarian, infralapsarian, all these types of of um, you know fine you know niggling points about um, you know the you know, absolutely understanding it properly. I, I don't really have a lot of use for that, really, because the, the pastoral concerns are much more pressing in that regard. Interesting. So. Um, that, 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 that all that makes predest, uh, uh, predestination sound less um, grim. <laughs> so yes, I, that's, kind of, that's kind of the idea, hopefully, that it sounds less grim. I, there's no way to get away from it without leaving you with a bunch of questions. I I just can't do that. I can't answer yeah, all the I questions mean, for you. And I'm just going to say that straight up. The way, the way, the way that it kind of filters uh, down into pop culture is, you know, it, pe people make it sound like, you know, Calvin said uh, these eight guys and nobody else. <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> That's what he wrote. Um, yeah, no, but, not, you know, um, Calvin was probably more pugilistic than, than, than most writers today, but even there, the, the idea of the doc, the doctrine, is and then that sounds crazy to a lot of people who struggle with it. It's actually um, pastoral in nature. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's the kind of thing that you can say to somebody when they've had a really really bad day and they come to you and say, you know, Pastor, um, I did it again. And you can say, Yes, I know, um, but isn't it wonderful that your salvation doesn't belong to you, mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. not dependent upon what you do or don't do? Isn't that wonderful? Now, this might this, these kind of thoughts can break people because when you face the magnitude of what you've done um, and realize that, um, you know, God still says, hey, welcome aboard, um, that those are the kind of those are the kind of thoughts that can really, you know, break you open inside. Um, and, and once that that's a good thing, by the way, um, because that can really change you as a person. Do you feel, uh, Kryptos, that your um, with it, with your writing and and your your su sub stack and just in in general your 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 cultural criticism, um, do you consider that to be very much kind of grounded within your your Calvinism, um, or, or would you say that you just kind of bring out a Christ a more Christian per perspective, broadly speaking, and 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 writ large um to to your sub stack well it it is um now because in many ways um my approaches to some things like because of the my, the influence of neo calvinism and and the, the idea of the kingship of christ that christ is king over um over all of creation you know that that uh, the the lordship of christ over all um me, you know, I, so I, I don't shy away from the idea of a Christian society, but there is a sense in in Calvinism that recognizing um, that the magistrate is a form of God's grace in in a sinful world. So, you know, you have the the the, the state, the king, the magistrate, and you have the church, the pastor. And they each have their own role, right? So the pastor ministers grace, preaches the word, ministers the sacraments. But God has also created these other roles um, like the magistrate. And there's a in a sinful world, you have this God-given role of the magistrate who um, wields power um, for the benefit of society. Because we live in a corrupted world where, where people are sinful, there is a need to punish the wrongdoer and, you know, even punish the wrongdoer to make an example of them for the rest of society to, because society needs that because there will be sinful people. And sometimes the only way to deal with some people is, you know, to punish them. Um, you'd love to be able to just simply present the gospel and convince them rationally and, and so, but it really doesn't work that. So God gives us this provision and Calvinism has always looked at that fairly clear-eyed 
and said that this is a necessary thing, but also understood that power corrupts. And so you have people that are called into this position to embrace this role that is inherently corrupting, to face that with the grace of God, and yet do things for the good of society, like wield violence to punish the wrongdoer. You know, that Romans 13 um, type thing. So there is this, um, now, like I have, in my undergraduate, I, I had the privilege of having a professor who himself had been very profoundly influenced by Eastern Orthodoxy. And so I have over the years been very influenced by, you know, Orthodox thinkers. So I have a, a mystical streak that many Calvinists do not. And really when we talked about sort of the rationalization of Calvinism, it's, it's, it's antidote in my mind is not, um, is not emotion and emotionalism, emotivism, like, so, um, but rather is is mysticism to to reconnect um, with the you know the transcendent the supernatural um, which I think for many Calvinists makes them very squeamish right so you mm. know enthusiasm right so you got to ward off these so you live in your head the problem with live is that you don't really then move the solution to living in your head is not to move to emotion but rather to reconnect to God without thinking, shall we say, without just meeting God face to face, without having to. So the idea of theology, um, theos and logos. So you have word and God um, in in the West, in Calvinism, in, in Catholicism, you know, especially in, in Scholastic, we've tended to think of theology as words about God, whereas the, the East tends to look at it as words to or with God. So prayer, liturgy becomes a becomes theology. It is theology. So to be a theologian, you pray, right? and that's. So I think for for Calvinism, that's sort of that. In to me, anyways, that is mysticism is the piece that that many Calvinists miss, hmm. um, and that as, and so I, I've always and I and I've, I've even said this to to um, Charles Haywood uh, that you know, going forward, I think. Um, the two traditions that have a really good chance if they're going to be bonded together to create something that is able to step to the forefront in the West. And I, I'm of the mind that it's going to be some mixture of um, Calvinism and Orthodoxy together. And that's just my own oh. pet theory, but that's, and maybe just because I'm biased that way. Um, but so th those are really your big pieces in that rare. So I tend to tend to, because people have asked me on the one hand, you know, are you Orthodox? I'm like, no, I'm still a Calvinist, right? And then other people have said, you talk a lot about power and so forth, right? So it, it comes from these various, th these different streams of recognizing that you have very specific roles in society, one for the church and one for the state and, and for the magistrate. And ideally the two work together in harmony um, each in their own role, playing off against each other, holding each other to account to create a good and just society um, that, that is modeled after the ways of Christ. Recognizing that you have these realities of, of, of the religious side, but then also the, the political side, which deals with um, you know, law, force, violence, and, and taxation, and all the rest of these kind of things. And then the church, which deals more with you know the the spiritual spiritual issues that we that we're familiar with, but the idea is is that that this magistrate is no less a calling than becoming a priest. Mm. Um. So on well on the on the subject of mysticism, <laughs> yeah. mysticism and, and enchantment enchantment. Um. Some oh, people yeah. might be uh still scratching their heads as to my my title of this stream which was the, the dangers of, of re-enchantment re so okay uh, i should probably dive into that a little bit um so uh, it, it, these these things kind of come in in waves on occasion uh, it's it's they strange do. but there was just this something in the ether something happened in in the zeitgeist um within the last month or so where, where suddenly everybody was talking everybody's about talking about it re-enchanting the world yeah so again oren mcintyre did a video on it it just seemed like it was it was on everybody's lips um i wish i knew definitively uh, i don't and i don't if, if kruptos if you do have a sense of, of where precisely this came from um please let me know uh, i i know dreyer talked about it very early um i 
I, I wonder if it isn't maybe Jonathan Pajot. Um, is that, well, he about, certainly has, has also, uh, he's been talking about it for a long time. Um, but you know, where it's hard to say, I think it's one of these things that has been out there. Um, just like a phrases in books that have been lying latent that I, somebody just that, kind of picked up. Alexander Dugan, or at least, you know, in translation, that could be the case yes. as well. Yeah. I mean, I think yeah. he thinks that in order to re-enchant the, the world, we have to like smash the Anglo empire so that's probably not what a, a lot of us are, well yeah are that's you know about. okay we can talk about that you know yeah. um but it but you took issue with this phrase yeah and, and you know and here's the thing too too right because Oren is a mutual and um you know we've had a chance i have a lot of respect for him and this was after i wrote the piece and published it i thought oh, i hope Oren doesn't think that this is a you know that i'm quote unquote subtweeting him i'm not really it's just sort of the ethos is out there and i get why people use the term it's handy it's catchy it, it has a good feel to it um but i thought to myself you know one of the things i one of my grad profs um you know, said a good distinction, a good definition is worth its weight in gold. And so I thought, well, this term is problematic in a number of ways. I get why people are are getting at it, but I said, we have to sort of pop the hood here and look at the issues that are are at play, right? So maybe we should start Kru Krupdas before, just before we dive into your, yeah. um, why, why you take a bit of umbrage with it. What do you think people, what what broadly do people mean by it? Is it just simply well, a matter of like Christianity reasserting itself within the no, West? I think, okay, so we live in a world that, you know, um, th there's no such thing as a world that's absent of religious belief, okay? So people believe things, you know, there's no such thing as a secular um uh, you know, a, a secular neutral space in, in society. Um, nobody is, it goes without some, some belief structure, right? but we live in a world following the enlightenment with the rise of, um, you know, the, the new learning that with, with, with science and, and the new method of, of, of grasping at knowledge and that following nominalism in the beginning of like the 1100s and sort of building up from, from nominalism through um, scholasticism, rationalism, the enlightenment, scientific thinking, that our world was gradually stripped of its superstitions. And, and you can really see the decisive break is with Kant. And Kant argues that while you might want to talk about um, ontological realities, um, you know, being or the forms, um, yeah, metaphysics. He argues that none of that is accessible rationally. So mm -hmm. you, there, there, you can't do anything with it rationally. You can't put it into words. You can't explain it. So he says there, there's this, you run up against a line where you just simply assume these categories a priori, and then you work from them rationally. But anything beyond that has no real rational content. There's no proofs, there's no disproofs. So the idea of the forms of metaphysics, of a of um, an underlying ontological um, structure in the universe, you can talk that way, but you can't prove or demonstrate any of it. You know, this is where, you know, it's, it's kind of funny that even something like say the constitution, when you say, you know, these truths we find self-evident. Well, there's no such thing as a self-evident truth. Mm -hmm. Um, especially since Kant severed um the 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 cut the tie with natural law, because you can't see the underlying rational or the underlying metaphysical like if there is such a thing as an underlying metaphysical moral order, you can't access it. So then the science steps up and says, you know, well, we're going to create a new foundation for knowledge. We're going to set aside these questions of why, what should we do, all of these metaphysical and religious questions, and we're just going to ask, how does the world work? 
Well, it turns out that this question of how does the world work is extremely powerful once you sever it from any kind of moral, ontological, um, religious, metaphysical concerns. So now you can just basically figure out how things work, how to harness them, how to turn them into um, you know, machines and so forth. But what happens over time is that the world becomes increasingly material. So even though nobody is an actual materialist, you know, just such a thing that really doesn't exist, um, because you know, true physical determinism is just a joke. As far as it's, it's just a, as a philosophical idea, it's just a joke. But functionally, in a sort of the practical realities of day to day life, we act in many ways as if there is only material reality. There's nothing beyond that, and so. Even many Christians who maintain the forms of religious language and God talk and all the forms of religious belief and talking about it, when you look at the datum of their day-to-day -day life, they live in many ways as if they are philosophical materialists. So into mm. this reality now, then people are hungering, and you can see the, the results all around us, you know, the mental illness, the, the loneliness, the angst, um, you know, all of the, the various manifestations in, you know, pathologies like um, transgenderism, homosexuality, drug use, rampant sexual, you know, rampant sexual pros promiscuity, um, uh, drug use, all of these things are meant to compensate for the fact that our society has cut us off from the metaphysical, the transcendent, the supernatural. So people look at it and say, well, what we really need to do now is to re-enchant the world, to reintroduce this, this metaphysical reality. And it, on the surface, it seems, it seems like a wonderful, and I don't disagree that we need to embrace the transcendent and the supernatural. My, my challenge is, is, is with the idea of quote unquote, re-enchantment. And partly it's just, it's, it's, it's a linguistic thing and it's a language thing, but, but words have meanings. And, and I think what they do generally tend to do then is to lead us down certain avenues that see in my mind, and this is when you, when you, when you look into a Lulean analysis, um, a Lul argues that magic is actually the first form of technology. Hmm. Right. So the way you do it is you gather the ingredients, you know, you you do it at the right time of the year under the right conditions. You say the right words, mix the ingredients in the right way. And if you do everything the right way, the result that you desire will happen. Well, what is a machine? You bring together all the parts, um, you assemble them correctly, you you power them properly, run the machine and the results you want will come out. You know, and then like that, there's that old um, say the saying that goes, you know, any technology sufficiently advanced is indistinguishable for magic. And there's right. a reason for that because magic is your first technology, right? Yeah. So, sort of like, I mean, alchemy was the first medicine in the same. That's right. Yeah, that's right. So, you know, I just, I in my piece, I just said, let's just look at this word enchant, right? So, you know, if you if you open up the OED, right, magic and chance them to exert magical influence upon to attract, win over, compel, or induce, um, you know, the action or process of enchanting. Um, you know, so the idea is, and, and this is where um, the, the argument that I made is that my sense of it is, is that what people are looking for is another technological solution. So they want a form of magic. Hmm. Give me my wand from Harry Potter. Give me mm -hmm. my corrupted Latin, right? Let me point my wand and I'll say it and then the magic will appear, right? And so that's, I think, for a lot of us, what we're kind of looking for is we want to, the, 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 the discourse of re-enchantment promises to us, um, and this is how I wrote it. So the word re-enchantment promises to us that the color can be returned to the world without us having to make un any fundamental changes to our lives or how we do things. Our life will be as if it has always been, but just now magical. Right. Right. So right. I don't it, have to change sort of anything like about modern that, society. You're, Sorry. You're taking the kids to Disney World. <laughs> 
That's for, right. Yeah. For summer I don't have to make any changes to the way I live my life, how I think or what I do. I'm just going to now enchant it and I'll have fairies in my garden. And my <laughs> life will now be full and rich and metaphysical and so forth. Well, it doesn't really work that way. Right. And so this, so I get into a number of things like um, thinkers like Carl Jung, Marcia Eliade, um, also um, uh, James Joyce, the, 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 the bicameral mind, and then also um, um, Ian McGilchrist and, you know, his book on um, the master and his emissary. And what McGilchrist argues and, and Jane's argue in their books is that um, you can observe this change that we have been talking about in our minds. So what McGilchrist argues is that there is this intuitive half of our brain that draws in information and just accepts it and leaves it kind of full. And then we have this other half of our brain that takes what we bring in in the other side of the brain, this intuitive kind of knowledge that makes leaps and, and all these things. And it rationalizes it. It takes it and turns it into words. It turns it into arguments. It turns it into concepts. Um, and it makes it usable, functional. It, in, in some sense, it rationalizes the, the intuitive side of our brain. And what McGillcrest argued is that since the Enlightenment, we have become so fixated on the rational that we've almost completely lost our attachment to the intuitive side of our brain. So this side of ourselves, and this is what Joyce argued in the in the severing of the bicameral mind, is that the modern man is actually less able to grasp the spiritual than the ancients were. In other words, we mm. have, because of our attachment to the technological mindset, we have actually made it harder for ourselves to apprehend God. We, it's just more difficult for us because we have been adapting our brains and our psyches and our spirits to a world that is material, that has no God. And so now we can no longer sense God because we've, you know, you might could say we've, we've bred the ability to actually apprehend God out of ourselves. Mm. Now, it's not quite that extreme, but that's got, I'm just sort of saying that this is kind of what's happening. So... It's not just as simple as a matter of waving a wand and saying some bad Latin. There, there has to be a fundamental change in the way that you live and, and, and receive the world, right? So, you know, I then draw from like Carl Schmidt and his idea of the miracle of law and from Augusto del Noce in his notion of ontology is that we have to re-embrace this idea that the ground of knowledge is not in the rational, okay? So what Kant tried to do to sever us from the metaphysical, from, from, from that which cannot be apprehended rationally, was he separated us from actually the true ground of knowledge. And so what Del Noce argues is that in his, his idea of ontologism, is that this intuitive grasping of the metaphysical, and, and Del Noce argues the supernatural, he says that these realities have real intellectual content. It's just they can't be rationalized. So it's the kind of thing, and I've used this example with my readers, you know, for those that are listening for the umpteenth time, I'll apologize. But there's a wonderful little passage in Proverbs um, chapters 26, verse 4 and 5. So the first verse says, um, do not correct a fool or you will get sucked into his folly, something like that. And then the very next verse says, correct a fool or he will forever remain in his folly. And you think to yourself, huh, mm -hmm. we have two verses that are you know, word of God saying the exact opposite thing. So if you think about it very rationally, your mind just explodes because now you have two things. You're being told, well, you need to do the opposite thing. So if you look at the, at the, at the Bible, like it's a policy manual, you know, rules for God, you know, God's rules for living, which is a terrible way to look at scripture. So you, you, um, if it's, if it's God's rules for living, you're now completely confused. But for the wisdom author who lived in a very, very different time from ours, for him, the answer is between those two questions. In other words, in the sense, there is no answer right? So you live, the, and this is why it says, you know, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You go up the mountain, like, you know, like Moses, you meet um, God at the burning bush or like Abraham, you know, when you're on the mountain about to sacrifice your son in that moment of testing, um, you meet God. 
and then standing before God, trembling before the Lord, um, there is now, these are all archetypal stories. So you're not going to do it in the same way that Moses did it or Abraham did it. Maybe you will, but unlikely you won't, but you'll have something in experience that is um, archetypally within the same class of, of a revelatory event. And so mm. in the moment when you meet the fool, if you live before God, you will know what to do. Now, what do you have? Well, you don't really have anything, but you have a real content because in the moment you will know what the right thing to do is. So there is this whole range of content. And this is why like since the middle or, or since the, 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 the enlightenment, we talk all the time about, you know, pursuing truth right? and the truth will set you free. And we don't realize, you know, well, truth in, in the biblical sense is a person. And what does that mean that truth is a person? Well, it's the same thing, very similar to the, those statements, you know, the, the two proverbs that are basically opposites. Well, Jesus is truth. Well, what does that mean? Well, it's very, you know, so your apprehension of this truth is always partial. But the, the, the real emphasis for the biblical author was not so much on, you know, scientific, rational truth, but having the wisdom to do the right thing in the right moment. So like Solomon, when you have two women who come before you, uh, two prostitutes actually come before you, um, one who, both of them had babies, one rolled over on the baby in the middle of the night and killed it. The other had a live baby. Now the one, you know, baby's like switched the two babies and then there's a dispute over whose baby it is. And so Solomon says, well, cut the baby in half, right? And then he watched the response of the two mothers and then, in watching them, he saw in the moment who the real mother was by watching the response. Now, you're going to write a policy manual for your governmental organization or your legal code, right, on um, the proper policy for cutting babies in half to prove that, that you know, which mother is the real mother. So in, in this sense, it kind of exposes sort of the, the folly of our rational policy manual minded system, right? Mm -hmm. So... But how did Solomon know? Well, he was a wise man. He had the, the wisdom in the moment, right? So this really is the knowledge that we're looking at. And then also the kind of mystical content. So um, it comes down to the, the Orthodox are better at this than, than the Reformed tradition because they have a really good and, and well-defined um, anthropology. So in, mm. in the Orthodox tradition, they talk about a person being both a human nature and a human person. So the human nature is that thing that ties us to everybody else, right? So things like language, even things like personality, stuff like that we would say divides us, like you're an introvert or an extrovert. Those are actually what we would call personality contact, and they are things that unite us with everybody else. So anything that you can point to as a visible, rational characteristic of a human of you is part of our human nature. But each of us also has a human personhood that cannot be reduced to anything else other than uniquely ours. It can be met and it could be known. You know, so we have this terrifying question, you know, that, that your wife will ask you, you know, why do you love me? Well, you know your wife and you've met her and, and you deeply know her, but what it is about her that that it, it is the thing that makes you fall in love with her, you can try to grasp at it and maybe try to rationalize it somewhat, but ultimately it it's something that you can't put into words. And it's the same thing like you have a like a, a friend that you you just look them in the eye and you know that they get you. Well, what do they get? Well, I don't know, but they've they've met me again. And so you have the same thing with with God. So the, the Orthodox would argue that God, in a sense, can't be known. In a sense, you can't rationalize the content that is God, but yet God at the same time can be met. And so you can meet God. Well, what did you meet? Well, I don't know. I met God. So you say, well, what, you know, talk about it. Well, why don't you come with me and pray? And then you two can you two can do theology in that regard. You two can meet God. So there is, and and what Del Noche argues in in his writing is that there's this fundamental ontological reality. He calls it ontologism. That this reality that we're talking about, this wisdom of decision, this is the ground of knowledge. See, whereas we would talk about the ground of knowledge is in the material world, is in the rational, 
Um, Del Noche argues that is that the ground of it is in this irrational. So for me, I'm thinking like, no, it's not about sprinkling fairy dust on on things and and you know having fairies in the garden again. It's what we really need is to reconnect with the forms, with the metaphysical, with the archetypal, um, with the supernatural, with the real presence of God. It's that intuitive knowing, that knowing that can't be put into words. In a sense, I've met God on the mountain, and well, what do you, what do you, what did you see? Well, I, I can't really put it into words. But that and thing that you can't what, put into words, what do you consider to be? Sorry to interrupt, but what? Yeah. What are the what methodologies put us in in that direction or bring us in into? There that is no method that can do it. That's the other thing. There's, there is no methodology. And this was, if you look at a philosopher like Hans Georg Gadamer in his book, Truth and Method, Gadamer argues that um, there is no method that can guarantee you to arrive at understanding or the truth. It, it isn't, there's mm. nothing that will guarantee you to arrive method. And this is the, this is the conceit of science that method will allow you to arrive at the truth. And Gadamer in like 600 pages, and it's a, it's a dense book. Yeah. He splits apart the argument that you, there is no methodology that can allow you to arrive at the truth. It just can't be done. Now there are better and poorer methods of, of doing science and so forth, but you cannot guarantee that you will arrive at the truth through methodology. It's a false conceit. And we've driven society because of its, the power of methodology um, to harness nature, to harness society, to produce money. Um, we've harnessed that, but in so doing, we've cut ourselves off from truth and we've cut ourselves off from wisdom. And so this is really, um, it, it, it means letting go of the idea. And so ultimately it comes down to, um, and this is really why, and Del Noche argues this too, this is why we have a loss of authority in our society because we, we are terrified. We want to put all of our trust into the system, into the method, because we don't want to trust that a person can be invested with the ability to make a pronouncement in the moment like Solomon mm -hmm. made. And this is what Carl Schmitt talks about in, in, in political theology when he talks about the miracle of law. He's talking about what Solomon did in that moment um, of, you know, cutting, you know, let's cut the baby in half. Because you, you, there's, no, there's no legal system that can that can lay out the framework for the proper moment to, to, to cut, a, to threaten to cut a baby in half. That policy right, manual right. can't be written. Right. And so what, what Schmidt argues is that every legal system um, eventually gets to a point, a crisis where you need somebody who can pronounce what needs to be done in the way that God pronounces law from on Mount Sinai or the yeah. way that Solomon voiced it in that throne room when he you had the two mothers in front of him. Right. That's right. And then, and this is the reality that we've got to re-embrace. So like, like, and for me, like I so said, when you talk about re-enchantment, it really is just like, you're, you're not even talking about the right thing really. And, and so this is really where I, I really, so let, let, let's, let's stop talking about re-enchantment and let's really start talking about, um, re-grounding, um, our experience of the world once again in the intuitive and in the supernatural and the ontological. And I guess that and I I I think I completely follow what you're you're saying, Kruptos, and and I agree. And much like reenchantment methodology was the wrong word for me to grab off of the shelf <laughs> to, yeah, to no, ask my question. Of but you I'm know, sorry, I just I've been dealing with these a long things. I didn't mean yeah, to be yeah. overly blunt. You know, this oh, is no, no, no. But like you know, what a bit better way to say like, how do we find ourselves? How do we reorient ourselves in that in in that direction? To, to become yeah. regrounded is that simply a matter of of prayer of becoming um somewhat in, in, embedded within a a church community or is it more esoteric than that no i i think that's really where it it a lot of it is begins with yes the practice and discipline of prayer re-embedding yourself in community but it also then I think once you get beyond that, it means fundamentally changing our orientation with um, technique and technology, right? So the the for the this intuitive side, the spiritual side of ourselves to 
reawaken and become robust again to get back into shape you know it's like running you know um you you the the thing that you have to sacrifice or diminish is the that impulse to rationalize everything and and the 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 artifact of rationality is our technical society and so you have to be at some point you have to confront and this is why you you can't do this and have life be the same for yourself as a society so your your prosperity levels will change and likely go down if you want to really you know if you want to really reconnect with the supernatural you your your society can't be as prosperous as it is because you can't push the levels of rationality in the economic to the degree that we do Right. All of, and that's what I mean is that, is that, you know, you're making fundamental changes to the way that life is lived across the board as a society. And I'm probably even rationalizing it more here than really you should, because there's no real plan for this, but there is a sense of, yeah, you begin with the discipline of prayer, immersing yourself in the presence of God, asking that he opens your eyes up, living within community, but then in this process, it, I think at some point it will demand um, both individually and communally, that we make fundamental changes to our relationship with um, the technical and technological world. Very well said, Kruptos. I think I, I'll, that that's a great <laughs> place to maybe end that um, section of the of the discussion. And again, I encourage people to read uh, uh, Kruptos's Substack. It, it's one of your more recent pieces, if not the, if not the most recent, um, the last, uh, the last real subject I wanted to touch with you tonight was, um, and you already alluded to it a little bit, but, um, when you were talking about the, uh, you know, what the future of American Christianity looks like. And I was, look, I was digging through some of our old communications on Twitter cryptos because I was trying to re remind myself of the context to this. But at, at one point I, I wasn't able to find it, but I, I remember you were commenting on um, your your Dutch Calvinism. Maybe you were just sort of uh, um, lamenting the fact that uh, different sort of Christian denominations, different Christian sects seemed so transient that people could sort of switch faith traditions like you'd try on a new a new jacket not to put words in your mouth um, and that you had this, you know, you're, you're a Dutch Calvinist, both. I mean, obviously you're very passionate and knowledgeable um, within your tradition, but you are also, you know, this is your tradition be because it is a tradition. Um, you know, you're Dutch. This is the, the church of your fathers. So you're just speak. born into it. And yeah, yeah the, the, I, I, it's a, a subject that I come back to very often is, is the, you know, the, that, that distinction between people that have, religion in a specific religion identity religious identity as a given as opposed to others like myself or you know i fundamentally am uh the a, a product of the american ethnogenesis that never happened you know that that failed <laughs> that failed sort of american ethnogenesis yeah uh, we could we could go we could probably go hours on on why that failed but yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I uh, basically, Kruptos, I am a living, breathing, like T.S. Eliot poem. I'm afraid to say it, but it's true. You know, I <laughs> was was raised secular. I have, um, you know, a dozen different sort of uh, uh, Christian heritages pouring into me, none of which um, bears greater claim on me uh, as a tradition since, since both my, you know, my mother was raised Catholic. My father was raised Protestant. Um, both of them had lapsed long before they, they, they had me. And I'm curious what you, how, how you would advise somebody in, in that position, um, who certainly does not want to materialist or use some, be too methodological, <laughs> so to speak, when it comes to, um, finding a church community or, or pursuing, pursuing God. Um, when, when you are sort of already somebody that is in some ways severed from any kind of natural and organic ties to a, a given faith yeah. tradition. And as you said too, I, I think this is another point is that it's, so, it's, it's always something that I observe and something that I think is very beautiful, but like there is these 
temperamental distinctions, you know, like the like the Calvinists co that come from more northern climes, northern regions tend to be maybe colder and more calculating. The Orthodox come from the east where that that rationalism has had less mm -hmm. of a, a death grip on the the mind. Um, you know, there you, you, I, I could go on, but that that kind of regional distinction and and. Uh, flavor of of religious culture, I think, is something um, quite beautiful. But I'm not sure where that leaves those of us that are kind of the the American mutts, so to speak. I mean, I can yeah, wait I mean, around until you and um, and Charles Haywood uh, form the the symbiotic Orthodox Calvinist Church, and then I, yeah, I would be go. happy to be your first um, first first member, it, but. Pending yeah, that. there you go. It it's um, it's a difficult question. It you know it it's hard in some ways for me who's born in a church, and so even when I had my rebellious youth, I mean, I came back to the ch church of my of my parents in that in that regard. So, you know, what do you do when you start from scratch? So start from scratch. The you know the world is your oyster, so to speak. And it would be ideally, it would be nice as if you know, you come back to church and there's just one church and that it's the same everywhere, but it it's not, unfortunately. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, one of, I think, you know, there's a number of things that, that Protestants do have to come to grips with in terms of arriving at the present moment that we helped contribute to some of, of what we see in the, in the breakup from, of, of the unified, um, you know, Christendom Catholic Church at the time, which was just the church. Now, the church at the time was corrupt and and history happened the way it did. And saying you can't relitigate Chris, you know, history, but we can look at for all the goods that that Protestant Protestantism brought. Um, it also had certain um, you know, downstream effects. Um one of those is as you focus on theology, there is a, a temptation to make the Protestant faith into something akin to an ideology. Now, that's not to say that your theology is ideological because it still remains religious, but it, it can take on some of the characteristics of, of an ideology. So um, while having a church that is faithful is important, like you don't want to wind up at some some liberal church that's going to just completely shipwreck your relationship with God. You know, if it's budding and growing, you want to be at a, at a church that is, is sound and godly and God fearing that way. But I would, I would caution from, you know, being overly worried once you're in sort of the broader realm of faithful churches um, to get too nitpicky, shall you say, theologically. Now you might be disposed more towards, um, the aesthetic and the mystical, and then maybe orthodox is your thing. You might be more disposed for towards, um, you know, the the hierarchy within the Catholic Church and the and the tradition going back to the like the apostolic tradition that may move you, despite some of the problems that the Catholic Church is having. Um, you might be moved by the rational. A lot of Protestants who become more intellectual generally tend to wander into Calvinism at some point. And there's various different strains of Calvinisms. There's like uh, Reformed Baptist even. Um, you know, so you have the Presbyterians, you have the the more ethnic reforms, and there's some like variations like Lutherism and so forth. Um, you might be the one that's predisposed towards, you know, the big mega church, the, um, the um, you know, the more broadly just um, bland I'm evangelicalism I'm, 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 for I'm I don't want to be too <laughs> slagging on that right um but I to me I think the thing to really pay attention to more so I mean you don't want to be in a place where you hate the preacher or whatever but I think really um is this a, a functioning community where people look like they evidence the joy of Christ like are these people that are really seem to be alive in the faith, that they don't just talk about it, they don't just say it, but despite all of their flaws, these this is a real functioning community um, where people are alive in faith. And then look at some of the telltale signs, you know, 
Is there a broad range of age groups within the community? You know, are there children that come up for children's hour at the front? You know, when they do that, you know, it, is is it filled with young families? Is it filled with, um, you know, the parents of those young families? Um, you know, and and so do you have children, parents, grandparents, and great grandparents all in a sort of a balance? And, and I mean, these are very material things to look at, but they're just indicators for the overall health. Is it a church where you can really get involved, or does everything happen by paid staff? I would prefer. I think if you're really looking to get integrated is be in a church where you can be involved, be integrated into the community. Do they meet socially? Like they doesn't have to be small groups, but do they do events where they have like, you know, church picnics or they go camping together? Do they do all of these types of things? Um, and do they do them together and look like they're a, a functioning community? So that might be that your size limited, you know, 200 to 500 attending in worship, you know, because once you get beyond that, you kind of get lost in the shuffle a little bit. Um, right. So, I mean, I attend a larger church largely because, um, we were at a, a, a smaller church, like I was describing with a fairly tight knit community. And, um, my, my sister got remarried and moved. I was the kid that went away after high school. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I was always away from home and my brother and my sister were always close to my parents, but then my sister got remarried and ended up to a gentleman that lives in the same town as I do, the same city as I do. And then, so my mom and my sister are fairly tight. So my parents moved close to us. And so my parents were now in town with me and I, I grew up at, actually in a, in a home missions church. So it was very, you know, cutting edge in the seventies. It was outreaching, growing, it's still reformed, but it was a cutting, outreaching, growing reform church. Um, and my parents now being in their late seventies, early eighties, um, they, went to a a larger seeker oriented church. I happened to be um, an acquaintance of the the pastor, so that was easy. So I attend a church that really isn't dispositionally um, my bag of tea, um, largely mm. because it's just I enjoy worshiping with my parents every Sunday. And then my in-laws came because now my my parents are there, my in-laws came. So I sit with my parents, my in-laws, and all of my kids all in one big row in church. And um, it's a seeker church, but um, I'm not there necessarily because of the church per se, but because this is, again, it's family, right? So, um, and, and who knows when my parents pass on, we'll probably find a church that's more smaller, more traditional and fit back in and get involved again because, and it'll be another Dutch reformed church. I'm, we probably have our eye on one in the neighborhood that, um, you know, we would just sort of slide back into a more traditional church once my parents pass on. Um, but again, because we have all of those, those community relationships, it makes that transition easier because we know everybody in that other church. <laughs> it's, it's not like we're going to a place where they're all strangers that way. But so I would, I would, uh, that would be my kind of key is, is to find a church where you have the feel that the community is real and vibrant. Like here's a place where I can grow and put down roots. Now I joked, you know, if you're, if you, if, if you're open and predisposition to Dutch Calvinism kind of thing, you know, find a nice Dutch farm girl, get married and then become <laughs> part of a community. And that's probably, you know, um, endear yourself to her parents and grandparents. And then you're in, they'll give you a, a van in the front of your name your current name and you'll, you'll, you'll have some sort of fake made up Dutch name that they joke about and you'll be in and you'll be part of the community. And then your kids and grandkids will, um, you know, have friends for three generations kind of thing. Um, so, I mean, that all sounds great. Um, uh, I, I, you know, I, I am married, but I, mar I married a Dutch girl. So that's, it, Oh, there you go. So that might be easy. <laughs> she'll, she'll know all about Dutch Protestantism. So that's yeah, you know, yeah. maybe. The um, um, I mean, it, it's interesting. I, maybe I lied a little bit here, Krupto. Sorry to keep you. Yeah, on no, that's a fine. A little bit more because it, it is interesting to you know. I mean, immediately you went to um, you know, these as did I, you know, these different denominations, these different types of churches, and you and you want to test for you know just basic signs of of <laughs> vitality, uh, and um, you know the the, the spirit of Christ, um. But I'm curious if you, I mean, you mentioned, and maybe this is just something that, that you and, and Charles Haywood are, are kind of postulating as a, as a kind of intellectual experiment of the, you know, this synthesis between Calvinism and, and orthodoxy. But do you have a sense that like, if, if Christianity sort of reasserts itself in, in the West or particularly in, uh, in, in America, 
Do you think that it's going to, does Christianity reasserting itself just, does that just mean dozens of different Protestant sects coming into their own again? And um, we, 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 re we retain that sort of archipelago of Protestantism within America and that become, but there's just a kind of <clears throat> revivified um, multiplicity of, of Christian fa faiths. Or do you think that 21st century Christianity is going to be something much more, you know, uh, I guess unrecognizable, unre but something more monolithic? You know, I I've heard a few people that, that I listen to begin to postulate that, you know, this, this schism between Christians is is something that's going to um, kind of come to an end within the next century, or or we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna be entering an era of a much more unified Christendom. And, and I don't know if you have any yeah I, on that or speculations. Well, I the way I, I you know you kind of plays out because you see certain dynamics in in the world around around us. I I'm generally of the mind that what we're seeing today in terms of things like you know people talking about christian nationalism and so forth that we are at the dawn you know the birth of something new and it's where it's it's very 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 early days um and there is going to be a lot of shaking out changing um there's going to be moments of choice, but because of the nature of the regime and the way it, it operates. So the progressive regime is built around this idea that we're always moving forward towards a better future. So quite simply, oppositionally, um, the, the, the bourgeois regime domesticated its Marxist threat um, through managerial um, uh managerial progressivism. But that revolutionary impulse that wanted to sort of sweep away the present order to bring in and usher in um, the, the, the coming utopia that we know will emerge once the present order is swept away, that revolutionary impulse and energy has to be directed somewhere, but not at the regime. So where does it get things? So now you know, the, the, the Marxist has embraced the idea, the revolutionary Marxist has embraced the idea that through managerialism, we can progressively implement um, utopia on society through technique. But who then opposes the march of, of progress? Well, it is the traditionalist. It is the Christian. It is all of these nasty people who don't want to break down barriers, who don't want to, you know, um, sweep away the past, who want to cling on to these old ideas. And so <clears throat> as we're, we're seeing the signs that the regime is losing its grip, that progress is, you know, technical progress is stalled, material progress is stalled, like financial progress has stalled, um, scientific progress is largely stalled, um, technological progress has largely stalled. And, and most things that we view this are, are merely just reiterations and recombinations of inventions that have already happened. There's not really any truly new innovations that are coming along. Not the way that they did in the 1800s and the early 20th century up until about the 1940s. So disposition, this is something that Augusto Del Noce argues, is that as the pressures mount on the regime, they're going to look for a scapegoat. And this is that classic René Girard um, in that the scapegoat is going to be looked for. And the scapegoat is going to be traditionalists and specifically Christians. And we really are in many ways, I would argue that the dispute that we have, and this is a, the, the piece that I wrote on the nature of the culture war, that we're really in the midst of a religious battle on, on and, and it's irresolvable. And so this conflict is, is, a unified society is going to have to emerge. Either the, the traditionalist and I believe Christian portion of the culture, it will assert itself and defeat the, the left or the left will crush Christianity in, in the West 
um, and become so dominant that, yeah, I mean, Christians may remain, but they'll basically have to, you know, keep your head down and just be very, very quiet about it kind of thing. Or there'll be kind of a split that the, the, the empire will fracture. Um, but in this process, as pressure is exerted on Christians in the Christian faith, and I think we're, that some form of persecution is likely coming as, as the regime scape goes. So as this pressure is put on us, it is really pressure that forges, um, you know, a strong community identity. Think of the kind of pressures that say are put on the Afrikaner community in South, uh, South, uh, in South Africa. So if you imagine those types of pressure for survival being put on the Christian community, the, the, the real enemy becomes much more apparent. And right now we're still in a phase where within Christendom and within Christianity, we don't know who the enemy is. We don't know who our friends are. We have some Christians that are pandering to the regime, thinking that if they're made safe, that they'll be left alone. There's others who are want to be very militant. Um, and so across the broad spectrum of the Christian faith, there, there's a real, we don't even know who friend and enemy is within the Christian faith. But as pressure is exerted, those lines will become much, much clearer. And what then emerges historically from that is, is going to be hard to say. But I think that if Christianity is going to become and emerge as a, a viable, um, you know, social force, in a sense, what we talked earlier about, you know, the church and the magistrate working together to create a, a healthy, well-functioning society. If that impulse manifests itself, it'll manifest itself in part because of the pressures placed on it by the regime. And it's in that forging process that the true enemy manifests itself. And then all of these old splits, they may resurface again later in, in a new time, but they'll be set aside for now because, you know, really, you know, what is an argument about, uh, you know, infant baptism versus adult baptism when you're being round up and thrown in prison? Right. Or you can't find work because, you know, and your family's starving because of things and you have to go to church mm -hmm. in order to get fed. Right. These types of things. So that to me is I think I see the pathway and, and how I see, um, you know, the historical playing out. And that's one path. I mean, there could be many different options, um, you know, that you could have end up with. And again, that came about really because of persecution, but the Franco route and Franco emerges in Spain because of the, the leftist pressure placed on the um on the christian community that they just basically stepped forward you know nuns were being murdered in the street and tortured and all these kinds of things it was just nasty mm -hmm. and so franco emerges into that situation and everybody bonds together and they make him dictator right or he makes himself yeah. dictator but he has broad support from the people to to assume that role so i mean historically it's hard to know but that's kind of how i envision it and when I look across the broader faith tradition, we talked about sort of the the no nonsense, um, kind of hard nosedness of the Calvinism with that kind of reconnecting with the mystical and the ontological, the the two communities that it, that evidence the the necessary components to, in my mind, produce the the the, the correct unity and balance within that is the what's in the orthodox tradition and what's in the calvinist tradition and sort of bringing that together and forging you know, what that ends up looking like who knows right mm -hmm. but it, to me it seems like the two big pieces that are there that's where they really reside today and will historic you know historical circumstances push us together that's kind of my sense of it anyways maybe that's just wishful thinking who knows cryptos would you could i mean uh maybe i'm i'm off here but i do you, do you, I, Roman Catholicism just kind of jumps into my mind as, as something that might combine the, you know, the, I mean, because the, you, you said the residual scholasticism of, of Calvinism, obviously the it's residual because it's something that, that they maintain from Roman Catholicism and that, and yet Roman Catholicism, I'd say it had a closer a closer tie to Eastern Orthodoxy than, than Protestantism, but you don't, you wouldn't consider Roman Catholicism to be that midpoint between the, the intellectualism of Calvinism and the mysticism of, of, of no, Orthodoxy. 
Catholicism is essentially it's Western in nature. And now there, there is within it, I mean, yes, there is a, a mystical and a supernatural element um, in Catholicism. Um, that's, that's undeniable. Um, I just don't know when I look at, you know, where it comes from. Um, it, it's possible. Um, but I don't know if Catholicism itself has, and I don't mean this to say this to offend any, any Catholics in the audience, whether it has what it takes to do what's necessary to, um, to, to step into the breach, so to speak, when, when this, when this mm. moment comes now that I could be mistaken that way too, you know? So a lot of these things are uncertain, but when I look out broadly speaking that the, the, the mystical component just maybe, and that's maybe it's just, it rings a lot clearer in the Orthodox tradition than it does. Whereas in the Catholic tradition, it's just, there's, it's there, but it's buried under just a lot of other stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the corruption, the hierarchy, um, you know, the Vatican sure. and, and just all of the machinations that are in there. Um, and, and, the, there, there is a certain rottenness in the in the Catholic institutions with like the the child abuse scandals and um, you know the the root of liberalism is far has has you know eaten dip deeply into the the core of the church that way in a ways that it hasn't in Eastern Orthodoxy. So we we'll have to mm -hmm. sort of wait and see. There's still you know, um, but it's that the prognosis for the Catholic Church is is frighteningly it is frightening and coming up ahead now. It it may write the ship may write itself, but but who knows? But it's just when you look at sort of what's going on there for, as an outsider, it's um, it's a little unnerving how quickly the the corruption has grown within the church. Indeed, yeah, yeah. Well, we may may we le live in interesting times. <laughs> so, um, Kruptos, I want to. I, I mean, we've been going we've been going ninety minutes, so we should probably call it. But th this has been a fantastic stream um it's been great having you on and and hopefully uh you'll be willing to come come on again sometime because i'm, I'm sure people have enjoyed hearing from you well i hope so it, it's been in um it's been a little different to just sort of talk because that's really this a lot of the theological talk is more in my wheelhouse um than some of the political and so forth because that's really mm. what i was trained to do academically right so um oh, well, yeah, so glad i can, you know, glad I can mix it up of, for you yeah, it was it was it was nice to kind of just come in and, and talk theology for a bit, and hopefully your, your your listeners have benefited from it. Um, I've enjoyed it, and my voice is slowly giving away right now because, as we mentioned earlier, this is my second podcast today. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you again, Kruptos. You take care. Yeah, you too.